There's many people today that are taking a stand for a cause that they believe in. Some good, some not so good. Well, today on Daily Renewal, I want to talk about the whys, the whens, and what we should be taking a stand for as a Christian. Have you ever heard the expression, it's time to draw a line in the sand? Well, you know, all around the world, uh, including where I'm from, uh, this week there was a lot of excitement in the news because there was a lot of people that decided they wanted to take a stand in regards to some of the things that are happening uh, in our culture. Uh, with what I will refer to as the V passport policy, uh, you know, a lot of places are saying that if you... Uh, if you haven't taken the jab, that you are not going to be able to go to some businesses. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of controversy over this. And there's a lot of people. Uh, in fact, in my city, you know, thousands of people decided to go out and protest, saying that this isn't fair. And they said, you know, for some of, the, some of them, it would be like they were saying, this is where I am drawing a line in the sand. And there's many people that are that are uh, on the exact opposite end of the scale who are actually going to protest as well. Uh, I think this coming week, saying that uh, they think that that some of these these things should be in effect. So that's their line in the sand. Well, today I want to take a look specifically at the when, whys, and what fors when it comes to making the decision to draw a line in the sand. I'm Pastor Lyle, and welcome to Daily Renewal. If this is your first time tuning in with us, I just want to ask you to consider becoming a subscriber to our channel. Uh, also, if you are getting benefit from our content, I just want to encourage you to like and share this video with anybody that you think that it will help. Well, we're going to look at this today. I want to look at one uh, particular character who had a real reputation for drawing a line in the sand. And that was uh, the character of Daniel in the Old Testament. And Daniel, uh, he was in an interesting position because, you know, being an Israelite, uh, they actually had been taken over by uh, a another group of people. And in the beginning of the book of Daniel, that's where we're going to start today, we see here that Daniel is put into an interesting position. But uh, before he gets into that position, I want to show you some things uh, in this story that kind of maybe even relate with some of the things that we're going through right now. So let's take a look at the book of Daniel. We're looking at chapter 1. And it says, uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and with some of the articles of the house of God, which he had carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of, of his God, and brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed uh, Ashpenaz, I think that's how you pronounce it, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Uh, so we see they were, he's saying, he was asking to bring, you know, there's a separation that's going on with people. You know, in other words, what he was doing is he's saying, I want you to bring the best of the people that we just took care of business on. I want you to bring some of them to me. And we're going to see that he had a purpose for some of these people. Uh, he said, uh, so, so the king's descendants, some of the nobles, uh, verse 4, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking. So he wanted the good looking ones, not the ugly ones, but the good looking ones. Uh, the ones who were gifted in all wisdom, the ones possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve be before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Meshiel, uh, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And we're going to stop right there. Now, the first thing that I want to establish here is that really up to this point, Daniel and his uh, friends here, 
they actually had it pretty good. They were in a position where when their country was taken over, uh, you know, by another warring nation, you know, the warring nation says, you know, we're going to separate. We only want the, the best people and we want to, and, and, you know, Daniel just happened to be on, uh, on the good side. You know, but there's a lot of people that maybe even family members of Daniel that didn't really, you know, they, they didn't, they kind of got a raw deal here. But Daniel was okay with that up to this point. Daniel decided, you know, that they, so he passed the first phase, you know, obviously he was good looking and had some gifting and, you know, he was accepted by these people. And then, uh, and, and so, so then the second part or one of the next parts we see uh, is that, you know, they're serving, they, they decided, uh, or this nation decides that they're going to take them in and they're basically going to teach them all their ways so, uh, so that they could have what would we, we'd look at today as a government job. In other words, we're going to give them a good job. Not everybody got a good job, but of all of these uh, Israelite children, Daniel and his friends were chosen to be trained up so that they would have a livelihood. They were going to have things good according to the, 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 the dictates, if you will, of the new culture and the new king. And then the next thing happens. All of a sudden, they're given new names. Now, this is really interesting because if you study out uh, all of the names, uh, names in general, uh, I don't know if it's necessarily when your parents named you, it, there was a reason behind the name. There's usually some kind of a reason. But back in these days, these Israelite, ch Israelite children, they all had names with real meanings behind their names that were prophetic uh, meaning behind their names that uh, were expected to come to pass. You know, there's some real uh, depth to why they named their children the way that they named them. It was very important. And so they get conquered by this country. And what's one of the first things that they do is they decide that, you know what? You can't live by your name anymore. We're going to give you a new name, a name that we choose. And, you know, I, I have to think that for a lot of these people, this would have been uh, something that wouldn't have been easy to give up, like uh, giving up your name. Now, for Daniel and uh, his friends here, they actually gave them names that were great for their culture, not for the Jewish culture, but according to what they named them. If you study this out, you'll find out that the names they gave them, the new names were all, uh, you know, real good names for, for, for what they believed. Uh, but I have to think that they weren't, this wasn't the ideal for a Jewish child to have a name given to them by a country that, w that they were conquered by. But again, Daniel and his friends, they took it. They took the job, they took the separation, and they took the new name. You could even say that they compromised on some things. And, uh, and they benefit, uh, benefited from some of the compromises that they made. You know, a lot of people don't really look at that part of the story. You know, when, when we look at some of the things that we're going on in our culture today, you know, anytime, or I often see, anytime there's even something remotely that that we don't agree with, uh, whether, you know, as for me as a Christian, you know, uh, but, but for a lot of people in general, when there's something that we don't agree with, it's amazing how much of a battle we will make to stand up for uh, some of the things that we believe or some of the rights that we think we have. And, you know, I'm not going to get into specifically some of those things today, but I want to establish here that there was times uh, in this story where there was a compromise made by Daniel and his friends, where they just kind of went with it. And you know, I think that there is times where we do need to pick our battles. Now, as we talk about that, though, now we're going to get into the point where Daniel decides that uh, he's going to draw his line in the sand. So let's take a look at this. It says uh, we're, we're uh, at verse 8 now, and it says, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, I want you to notice here that, that as I mentioned, Daniel may have compromised a, a little bit up to this point. 
But he came to a point in his life where there was something that, that uh, they brought before him. And in all honesty, what they brought before him, they, as a culture, were looking at as being something that was a good thing. You're going to eat the king's delicacies and the king's wine when there was a lot of people that didn't even get a chance to have anything nice at all. Here they were. They were going to eat some of the best of the best. But it says here that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself by eating this food and drink. Why was this such a big deal? Now, I want to talk a little bit about this today because, you know, for us, as I mentioned earlier, we have to learn to pick our battles. And for Daniel, this was the battle that he chose. He chose uh, not to defile himself. Well, how would he defile himself by by eating, uh, uh, eating the king's food and, and drinking the king's wine. We have to understand that there was a lot of things back in the culture in this time that, uh, you know, there was a lot of meats that uh, the Jews didn't eat. And uh, when they did eat them, or if they did partake of them, you know, whether it was meat that was sacrificed to idols, which this particular nation, there would be a good chance they would be eating meat sacrificed to idols, or there was different animals that the Jews considered unclean. So uh, just because this nation thought that these meats were all good, <clears throat> to a Jew, these were actually things that they looked at as defiling themselves before God if they partook of these things. So as, as we look at this story, what we have to understand is this wasn't just about meat and drink. There was something within Daniel that said, you know what, um, I, I, I can't do this because this is a line that I will draw in the sand because if I draw this line, if I, if I pass this line, if I come across this line, then what I'm doing is I'm putting myself in a position where I'm not right before God. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about that in particular today. Now, b uh, before we get into that, let's take a look. Uh, I, I want to just show a couple things with Daniel, that, uh, because this wasn't the only line in the sand that he drew. Daniel was a man that, again, compromised in a couple things, but whenever it came to the idea of defiling himself or, or something that would affect his walk with God, that is where he took his stand. And in this particular part of the story, he took his stand. And it was interesting because God had actually given him favor um, with, uh, with the, uh, the, eunuch, the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs was actually a little bit scared here. Because when Daniel took this stand, and you can see this as you read down a little bit, it says that... Um, he says, and the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed uh, your food and drink, for, for why, uh, why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men uh, who are your age? Uh, then you would endanger my head before the king. So the very guy that he's kind of befriended, that was part of this other nation, he's actually potentially putting him in jeopardy as well. And, you know, I'm wondering, at times I wonder sometimes with the decisions we make, you know, how much of the, the, the decision making has to do with just my comfort or, or how it affects me? You know, I think we do it oftentimes need to consider, you know, how our decisions do affect other people. And in this particular case, there was a potential for uh, somebody that uh, Daniel had favor with in the kingdom that had conquered them to potentially have uh, uh, cause a rift or cause a problem even in that relationship. Well, the amazing part about it and the thing that we need to take from this story today is that when Daniel took his stand, just like when we take our stand, if we take our stand about the right things, and we're going to get to the to what some of those right things are, uh, so we can uh, help decipher what you know, what's worth taking a stand for. We're going to talk about that in just a, a few moments. But I want to show you here that when Daniel took his stand, uh, in two particular times in the scripture, uh, number one, he took a stand because of his relationship with God. But number two, there was some things that happened, some results that came when he took his stand. And we have to understand that you know, God is looking at everything that we do. And whatever we do take a stand for, whatever we do uh, have as our line in the, in the sand, if we're doing it for the right motives, 
You have to understand that God is right there, and God is the one who rewards us for the stands, or uh, or uh, the opposite of that, uh, you know, He's the one who who uh, you know gives us the consequences at times when we maybe don't stand for the right things. I mean, that could be another message that I'll talk about in another day. But specifically today, let's take a look. Like I, I want to show you what one of the results was uh, as a result of Daniel taking a stand. This was a complicated situation, and what happened was, is God actually gave uh, gave uh, Daniel and his friends, uh, it, we see this in verse 17, it says, as for these young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And this is really important because, you know, Daniel basically said, hey, give me 10 days. And, and so they gave him 10 days. And when he came before the king, the idea he had to eat a specific way and, you know, the, to kind of, you know, to do things a little bit differently than what the king had kind of ordered to do, it was expected that that was going to, you know, cause them to, to not be healthy and, and not do well. Well, the exact opposite happened. And, and, and truth be told, he was actually operating in some of the eating food principles that God had already set down. But as a result, when he came before the king, not only did he look, did they look better than uh, all the other people who had been eating uh, the way that the king had ordered, but the king himself talked about the fact that, uh, that, that uh, these particular Hebrew children were 10 times better than all the kings and magicians and uh, uh, kings, magicians and astrologers. And uh, so we see here that when Daniel decided to take his stand, God honored that stand by giving him both wisdom and favor. So point number one, if you take a proper stand, for God, guarantee that he can give you wisdom and favor with those who uh, may, might even be your enemies. Now, the second time that we see that he took a stand, uh, we see this in chapter 6. And again, Daniel's in a totally different position now. I mean, he's got a great position. Uh, he's respected by many people. But there, there's some changes that happened as far as the, the, the headship of the land. But again, he's got favor, but there's people that don't like Daniel, uh, you know, probably because of his heritage and because, you know, he's got the favor of the king. And so in, uh, in chapter six, starting in verse seven, it talks about, about the fact, it says, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and the advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever peti petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, so they're bringing this petition to the king, shall be cast in a den of lions. Now, so what they're doing here is they know that Daniel, through this entire time, the one thing he has not done is bow to foreign gods. He still serves the God of Israel, and he still prays to the God of Israel. So these guys, they all figure, well, what we're going to do is we're going to set a trap for Daniel because Daniel is known for praying. And uh, so we're going to basically make this rule and we're going to, you know, they set him up because the king, he, the, he had the favor of the king. So these guys all come in and what they did is they set this up. And they basically said to the king, king, anybody that, that worships to anybody other than you has to go in a den of lions. And so the king goes, well, yeah, okay. That sounds like a great idea. He says, now, O king, establish the decree in verse eight and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Med uh, Medes and the Persians which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius, uh, the new king, signed the written decree. Then now listen to verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke 
uh, concerning the king's decree, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into a den of lions? The king answered and said, This thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. And the king was very sad about this because, as I mentioned, Daniel had favor with him. But if you read this story, and for the lack of time, I won't read it, read it yourself here. Basically what happens is Daniel's thrown into the lion's den and the lions don't eat him. And, and in a certain amount of time, they pull him back out. And it ends up that God not only delivers him, but he all it, it also comes to the point where his very enemies are thrown into the lion's den afterward. And of course, their fate wasn't near as good. So, that, so what we have to see here is again that Daniel was bold in his stand for God. And as a result, as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, God delivered him from his enemies. You know, it's important that we understand that you know, when it comes to the things of God, this is where we need to take our stand. And again, I'm going to get in a little deeper into that in just a few minutes. So, so I want to just specifically touch on three things today. I want to talk in the when, uh, talk about the when, the why, and what fors when it comes to making the decision to draw a line in the sand. Now, the first one, uh, we'll go back to the very beginning of Daniel, Daniel 1. Uh, when we go to Daniel 1, 8, I want you to notice here, it says, when all of these decrees started to come down, it says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the, the wine which he drank, etc., etc. Notice he says that he purposed in his heart. I want to tell you this. When it, when it comes to making a decision on drawing a line in the sand, you know, I think one of the key things that we have to understand is that we have to purpose in our heart that when we draw that line, that when it is crossed, we have to have uh, we have to have a plan for what we're going to do. In other words, you know, I, I've heard many uh, politicians say, "Well, I'm going to draw a line in the sand, and and this is the line," and 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 it's, and it's like you, you're just daring somebody to cross it. And I've seen many times where that line was crossed, and 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 when the when that person didn't have any uh, idea what they were going to do, they just thought, "Well, you know, if I draw the line, nobody's going to cross." Well, what happens when somebody does cross the line? What are you going to do? And, you know, I think for all of us, we have to take from Daniel here that Daniel had made a decision, even though there was some things that says, you know what, if this happens, I can handle this. If this happens, I can handle this. But if it ever gets to this point, this is when I know I have to take a stand. That decision was made far before he ever got to the point where he was challenged with it. And that's something I think that we have to pick up today with, uh, with the things in our culture. You know, as we look at some of the things that go on, you know, when I make my decisions on, on the things that, that, uh, that I will let go and the things that I won't, I have some very specific things that I know that when and if this specific line is crossed or specific lines are crossed, then this is what I will do. This is how I will, will respond. And, uh, and that is really important that we ha have these things pre-thought out. And I'll tell you why. That brings me to the, my second point is, you know, the why we draw the line. I'll tell you something that I learned uh, early on in my Christian walk, or I, I, I won't say early on, but I had been in ministry for, for a few years. And, you know, with some of the things that go on in the church world today, um, you know, I, I found myself in a situation years ago where, you know, I, I would see things going on in church, and I was on staff at a church, and, uh, and you know, I would see things go on, and we kind of, you kind of always brush them aside, you know, and I just want to establish, you know, there is no perfect church, you know, we, we the church is run by imperfect people, and they're going to make mistakes, and, but how we handle our mistakes, how we handle, you know, I really believe that we all, whether we're a pastor, or whether we're, uh, you know, wh whether we're just a, a new believer, it doesn't matter where you are in your walk with God. The approach that we should take is, is that when God reveals something to me about my own life or about the direction that I'm going, then the way that we want to respond is, is uh, when, when something's revealed, is we should acknowledge it, be willing to, uh, to uh, 
not just acknowledge, but be willing to correct it and go the direction that God shows us. Uh, specifically, if there's sin in your life and you know, maybe you don't think of it much. I mean, I, I remember when I first uh, you know, started serving the Lord, you know, there was things in my life that uh, I didn't even think were a big deal. But as I got closer to the Lord, all of a sudden I'd be doing something and and uh, something would come into my, it was like something come into my heart and go, you know what? I don't think this is right. I don't think God really likes this. And when that happened, I would go, okay, well now, if I don't think that God's like this, uh, or God likes this, you know, I would often, I'd be reading my Bible, and I would find that there was things that, okay, well, yeah, I see that in the Bible, that would often happen. But it would start with just, you know, this, I'm not sure if God is pleased with, with what I'm doing in this particular situation, or how I'm handling it. From there, I was faced with the decision, what am I going to do about that? And if I felt that it was something that God wasn't pleased with, from that point, I would ask the Lord about it, and then I would do my best to have a clear conscience before God and change my direction. You know, uh, you know a lot of people, when we look at the word repentance, the word repentance uh, is, is often uh, uh, walked out like that. You acknowledge that you did something that's not right before God, and you make a decision to ask God to help you or forgive you, but then from there, you make a decision to go the other direction. And uh, so, so this process is really important to understand as I tell my story. Now, I had been in ministry for a few years, and some of the things that just happened in the church, and again, uh, I'm not trying to bash a specific church, but I find that there's a lot of people that after going through this scenario, a lot of people, um, when I explain what happened to me, this helped them. And so, so what was happening is, is I was noticing some things in the church that were, that were kind of off track and, you know, but, you know, we had this impression or this idea that, you know, that, that we were the best church in town. And uh, we often talked about the fact that, you know, and I, I was a big contributor to that. I, I have to admit you know, I, I would often, this is my thought process, I'd, I'd think to myself, you know what, well, there's some problems here and some things that maybe aren't right here, but you know, where else would I go? This is the best church in town. That was how I thought. And I thought, well, you know what, if it ever gets so bad, and I, you know, kind of a scale, I said, you know, we're right here, but if it ever gets to here, that's when I'll know that it's time to leave. And things would kind of go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong. And then it would get to here, and I'd be faced with this dilemma, and I'd go, well, yeah, but if it ever gets to here, then I'll know that it's time to make a decision. And things would just kind of go and go and go and go, and they would get to there. And I would be just kind of in this position of going, well, yeah, but, you know, where else would I go? This is the best church in town. And then the, the bar would just keep going and, I, and, and, and going and going and going. And, you know, after years of doing that and meaning well, you know, I, I meant well with everything that I was doing. I came to a point in my life where God stopped me. And, he, and, 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 I, and I look back at all of these compromises where I didn't draw a line in the sand. I kept going because there was consequences, you know, if, if you make decisions to either leave or whatever. And I'm thankful that God found a way to get me out of there. Uh, but, but again, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be specific about a church, but I'm going to tell you that there's a lot of people I've found that are in places like this where, you know, if they're in, a, and I just use church as an example, but maybe it's your work experience. Maybe maybe there's other situations in your life where you're saying, yeah, you know, it's pretty bad here, and you might feel like the Lord is kind of telling you, you know, you need to watch this, and, and you kind of make, you draw a line, and then all of a sudden it gets to that line, and you go, well, you know, I don't know, and you hey, if you're in that position, you'll find out, like I found out the hard way, that after many compromises, if the Lord is merciful enough like he was to me, he'll get to a position where all of a sudden you'll stop and you'll look back and you'll realize that from here to here and all the compromises that you've made along the way, there is a very big void to where you said you were going to take a stand and where you actually take a stand. This is why I think it's very important 
that you know we really ask the Lord early on, what kind of things do you want me to stand for? Uh, you know, and and from there, when I get to the point where where maybe some of these things where where they're right on the edge, what do you want me to do, Lord? When I draw the line in the sand, what should my response be? These are the kind of questions that I think we all need to ask if we're going to move forward spiritually. I've seen many people shipwrecked in their faith because they've made compromises like this. And once you, if you continue to compromise in, in things, uh, the things of God like that, you're going to be amazed at how, uh, you know, how much shame and guilt and, and all the, the things that add up uh, after time. Well, I've seen a lot of people that never come back from that because they feel like they've just let God down. Well, the great part about it is, is that the Lord sees all this and he has made a way for us to be able to repent and for us to be restored. But for some people, they never recover. And so I want to encourage you today, uh, you know, seek out what is it that God wants you to draw the line in the sand with. Now, that's where I want to get to the last point today. Because again, just because you're drawing a line in the sand for something, that doesn't mean it's something that God is even happy with. I've seen a lot of people, Christian people, that are drawing lines in the sand about a lot of the things uh, that I mentioned earlier, cultural things, you know, whether it's our rights, you know, some would say our God-given rights by our country. You know, a lot of the things that people consider God-given rights weren't actually God-given rights. They were rights that were given by men and uh, that, uh, you know, men of old, mostly the time they were men, uh, that uh, when they were establishing the country, there were men that were trying to serve God and they, they maybe used the Bible as their guide, but it wasn't something that specifically was a God-given right. Now, there is some that are God-given rights. So for us, if we're going to draw a line in the sand, I want to challenge you with this. And it's the same thing that Daniel did in both the examples that I gave today. And that's the idea of defiling yourself. Now, defiling yourself before God is always the last line or the litmus test of a line that should never be crossed. And, uh, and, and you might be saying, that's exactly right, Pastor Lyle. I am not, when it comes to anything that defiles me in my walk with God, that's where I'll take a stand. Well, I'm going to tell you right now that especially in the North American church, which I am a part of, there's many things that happen on a Sunday that if you really read your Bible, there's many practices that churches are really walking on the edge, and I would even say walked over the edge with, in regards to practices that are actually uh, a potential defilement between them and God. You know, when we look at the, uh, what defilement is, I mean, we, can, we know that the defilement, uh, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament, well, in the, in the Old Testament, you know, there was a lot of different things that would be defilement, as we see here with eating different foods and things like this. But, you know, mostly defilement usually came down to uh, sexual immorality or idolatry. And even in the New Testament, idolatry and sexual immorality. But the, the idea of idolatry is something that if we're not paying close attention to, and attention to, easily creeps into our life. There's many things that we have made idols. Now, I'm going to make this simple. And what an idol is, is anything that you value or you put ahead of God. And we can see from Mark uh, 1230, uh, and we, we see this in, in other portions of the Gospels, uh, this same uh, saying, uh, but, uh, or the same scripture. But in Mark, for, for the sake of us having a scripture to look at specifically today, let's look at Mark 1230. It talks about the fact, it says, And uh, we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, uh, you know, this is the first and greatest commandment. And then it goes on to talk about the se second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. But the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And this lines up with the Ten Commandments of having no other gods before him. So when we look at idolatry, it might si sound like an old biblical term. But if we want to bring it into, in, into today's reality, we have to ask ourselves, is there anything more important in our life than God? And, you know, you might think, there's some days where you might think, yeah, I do, I'm doing pretty good with this. All of us will be challenged from time to time with, 
is, uh, is this certain thing more important to you than God is? And I, I really like to relay this story. I remember a time with my mom. You know, my mom, when I first became a Christian, my, my parents had a struggle with me becoming a Christian. That's a long story. But I remember one day my mom phoned me and out of the blue, I'm a new Christian. She says, hey, I have to ask you a question. It says in the Bible that you're supposed to love God more than anything or anyone. And I'm thinking, where did she get that? And she says, is that true? And I said, absolutely, that's true. And she says, does that mean that you love God more than me? Oh my goodness, that was a tough one. But I'm going to tell you, God gave me something at that very moment. And I said to her, I said, Mom, you got to understand. Like I, and I told her, you know, I, I was a wreck before I became a Christian. On the inside, I was, I was dying on the inside. You know, on the outside, a lot of people might have thought I had things. You know, things were okay. But anybody that really knew me knew that I was dying on the inside. I was broken. And when I, when I decided to follow Jesus... He did, he, he did a new work in my life. And, and like the Bible says, I was like a new creation. And, and you know, my capacity for love was way more than it had ever been. And I said to my mom, I said, Mom, I said, mom you got to understand that you might not be as high on the top 10 list as you used to be. But because I love God more than anything else, he's increased my capacity for love. And therefore, I love you more than I loved you before. And, you know, I look back at that time and, you know, it was amazing how I was, I was just amazed how God could put that on my heart. But, you know, as I look back at that, that whole idea of how the, the level of or dimension of my love was able to change, that's the same with every area or every aspect of our life when we make God number one in our life. This idea of, of having, as it talks about in Mark 12, you'll uh, have a... a, a loving God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our strength. He's, he wants us to do that because if we do that, that will change every other aspect of our life. And so when we see somebody like Daniel, who understood this idea of not wanting to, to defile himself before God, when he took the stands that he did, what it did, as we saw it with the results, is it enabled him to have uh, greater wisdom, enable, enabled him to have favor, even with his enemies, and it able, enabled him to have deliverance. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things, benefits, for him to not defile himself. So, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about even, even sin, you know, oh, I don't want to sin because I don't want to make God mad. You know, we have this idea of God's this guy who hang, you know, guy with a white beard hanging around the corner waiting for us to sin so he can hit us with a big stick and destroy our lives. No, God wants us to be, to stand before him and, and to love him enough to say, you know what, I want to walk the way you want me to walk. Because understand this, God has a way for us to walk because he knows what's best for us. And so, you know, this idea of not wanting to defile ourselves is critical, uh, in, not only in our relationship with him, but for us to be able to live in such a way that God has designed for us to live, um, uh, live properly here and, and have uh, the best results. So, so back to this idea of uh, taking a stand. Daniel took a stand in both these cases to not defile himself. So for us, when we make our decision on what we take a stand for, it should always come down to asking the Lord or having a clear conscience before the Lord in the decisions that I make. Yeah, in other words, you know, if if I'm going to take a stand for something, I pray about it. Lord, is this something that is this the you know the, another expression <laughs> you know is this the hill that I will die on you know is this is this the one that you know it doesn't matter what happens I am going to stand for this uh, you know if they put me in jail if I get ridiculed if I lose friends because I've seen a lot of people that the stands they take for take uh, you know they're losing friends or you know they're getting in trouble some people even in jail uh, if if I'm going to take a stand for something I want to know that the, the final stand I take will always be, you know, Lord, I will take a stand if it's something that is going to directly affect my relationship with you. And from there, if they want to put me in jail, if they want to, uh, you know, do worse than that, you know what? I make a decision before I get there that this is the stand I will take. Now, there'll be other stands along the way that are important to me, uh, but, but when it comes right down to how far will I go, 
I, the, the stands that I take in life are always ones that I'll talk to the Lord about. I have to have a clear conscience about what I'm doing. If I don't have a clear conscience about something that somebody wants me to do, whether it's government or anyone else, if I don't have a clear conscience before God, that's probably a time to take a stand. But for sure, it doesn't matter who it is. If they're trying to tell you, for instance, you know what? You can't be a Christian. You can't read your Bible. You can't pray. Those are things that are absolutes in the Bible that are worth taking a stand for. And there's more, I'm sure. But for those in, in particular, those are some that it doesn't matter who tells you. I don't care how powerful they are. If they tell you you can't do those things, those are things that God has already said that we should do or that we need to do. And so I have to, at that point, choose between God and man. Well, I hope you got something out of that today. If you did, I just want to encourage you again to consider becoming a subscriber to our channel. Also, uh, if you like our content, uh, yeah, like and share these videos with as many people as you think that they will help. I really enjoyed our session of daily renewal today, but until next time, God bless you and have a great day.